Before I begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people as the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting this evening. And I'd like to acknowledge their long contribution to our environmental and cultural heritage, past, present, and future. And I'd like to extend my deepest respect to all First Nations people in attendance here this evening. Well, welcome to tonight's Provocations Public Lecture, co-hosted by the Royal Society of New South Wales and Charles Stewart University. Uh, my name's Mark Evans, and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research at Charles Sturt, um, and your host this evening. Um, welcome also to our online audience. I think we have um, over 150 people registered for this event, um, and the event is being um, fast-streamed um, across our, our campuses and also to, to a public audience as well. Now, Provocations is a series of public lectures, panel discussions, and blogs written by prominent thinkers that seek to address some of the great intellectual and social challenges confronting Australia, and particularly regional Australia. Um, and the idea is to develop new thinking around those, those problems. Um, so in the first instance, I'd like to um, direct you to the Provocations website. So if you Google Provocations at Charles Sturt University, um, you'll get to, uh, to our blog. Um, and all of the past lectures and panel discussions and podcasts are available there for you. Um, so there you'll find some... some excellent uh, podcasts and addresses by Clive Hamilton, Sharon McLeod, Wayne Hudson, um, Patrick Walsh, amongst others. Um, and of course, on each topic, we encourage reasoned online engagement and debate. Now, this evening's lecture will further strengthen our range of provocations. So tonight, um, Professor Shukafe Shamsi will address the question, Parasites, Australia's Silent Threat, Coincidence, Nature's Hand, or Policy Complacency? Question mark. So by way of introduction, uh, Professor Shamsi is a professor in veterinary parasitology in the Gilbali Institute of Agriculture, Water, and the Environment. She holds a master's degree in medical parasitology from Tehran University of Medical Sciences in Iran, and a PhD from the University of Melbourne, which explains her passion for research into transmissible parasites between animals and humans. She is a taxonomist who leads research teams that seek to identify new species of parasites and how they reflect population changes in response to anthropological and environmental factors. So her research focus um, and examples of her research achievements include discovering 37 new parasite species in Australia, discovering new invasive parasites um, that have been introduced to Australia, and also determining novel natural transmission patterns of parasites affecting critically endangered, endangered Australian species. Um, her recent research has also broadened to include the lessons that can be drawn from Australia's First Nations on challenges um, in terms of environmental sustainability. On behalf of the university, we are absolutely thrilled to host Shukafe's pioneering research, given the importance of protecting Australia's biodiversity and biosecurity. I give you Shukafe Shamsi. Okay, hi everyone. I also like to start my talk by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, Wiradjuri country here, and also pay my respects to the elders and past and present. 
I also extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So usually I start my talk by introducing myself, but thank you, Mark, for introducing me. And plus, I have more research, and I will be talking about uh, more slide, and I have be, will be talking about my research there. So I skip this slide, and instead, I want you to take you all to a virtual plane, and we're going to fly to Europe, to the beautiful city of Florence in Italy. Most of you know about Santa Maria Cathedral, which is very beautiful and famous there. But what you may not know is that there, next to it, there is also a beautiful gallery and a statue of many famous people, like Leonardo da Vinci, can be found there. But also among them stands this man, this man's statue, Francesco Redi. He is known as the father of the modern parasitology. But why do I say modern parasitology? Because like other science, like astronomy, parasites were known for many, many years, thousands of years before Christ to human being. And again, like astronomy, the science was mixed up with a lot of fictions and human imaginations. So what we knew about parasites wasn't really accurate, and it was him who, for the first time, described 180 parasites and provided evidence about their life cycle and how actually they get transmitted between in different animals, and from then, the science got revolutionized. While we are in Europe, I also take you quickly to Greece, because the word parasite comes from the Greek word parasitos. It has been uh, Latinized, and I don't know a few other changes, but basically, parasite is not anything scary. We all one way or another, dealt with parasites in our life, with the concept of parasite. Para means neighbor, and site comes from citus, meaning wheat or bread. So in Greek uh, language, people who eat on other people's table are referred to as parasitos. So later, scientists use this term to refer to a species that rely on other species for living. Which means, from today onward, if you consider yourself as a scientist, you cannot call your neighbors, your children, your little brother or sister as parasitos anymore. It has to be two different species. So, now that we know what parasites are, it's really important to recognize that parasites are not only just these creepy creatures, like head lice that everyone knows, or some wiggly, wormy creatures. They are actually a lot of other things, like this one, which I also have the necklace of it. It's a new species, and the photo is so bad because I took the photo, and it's very tiny. A new paper just came uh, published in Marine and Freshwater Research, a parasite published by Australian CSIRO just a few days ago, and we described this new species there. It's actually two parasites, you see there, that look like a butterfly. When they are young, they are just swim in the water and happy with their life, and as young adults, they meet each other, they hug each other, and they live on the gill of a fish as a home, like that forever for the rest of their life. So one of the most committed romantic relationships you can find on planet Earth are found between parasites. There are also other parasites that human uses it. As you know, artists, they make pictures, and believe it or not, they get sold quite expensively, and people put it on the house, you know, on the wall, I don't know, however, they know it's a parasite, like this one is a liver fluke, or they think it's an autumn leaf or whatever. And they also get used, like this one, which you can find in the gastrointestinal of Australian sharks, are quite like animated characters that we have. So, but despite their diversity and different uh, shape and forms they have, 
It's funny that when we talk about parasites, if you ask anyone why parasites are important, and that's the first question on my first lecture I ask my students since I started my academic job, the answer immediately is because they are bad, they kill us, they kill our animals, they make our pets sick and stuff like that. And that's quite true, I don't argue with that, but there are more into parasites than that. So let's start by what we think we know, which is quite right. This slide shows deadliest animals for humans. And as you can see, number one is mosquito. Mosquito is parasite. Female mosquitoes are actually parasites. They are like vampires. They feed from the blood. Male mosquitoes are vegan. They just feed from plants. But females just feed from the blood. And not only that, they also carry, as we all know, other parasites, viruses, and other disease agents with them to humans. So they are actually very scary double killer parasites, and they are number one animal killer for humans. For example, they transmit a parasite called plasmodium. That's a parasite that causes malaria. And it's such a deadly parasite that right now that I talk to you in 21st century, Every minute, one child is dying because of malaria, because of mosquito bite in many African countries. So it's really, really sad, and it's really, really bad. Not only that, and there are many other uh, parasites in here that I just put a, a yellow arrow next to them. But also, I want you to think about, we are in 21st century, we have a lot of advances about treatment, control, and also prevention of infectious diseases, and we still have this. And plus, not only we are in the 21st century, we are sitting in Australia, a country that is a developed country with really amazing scientists at the forefront of a lot of other areas of science, yet, if you go and check Meat and Livestock Australia website, you just see right on front page, on the very first line, that parasites are number one cause of economical loss for Australian farmers. So that means we are way behind with dealing with parasites. And why we are that, again, is a really good question. But let's see. But if you ask me why parasites are important, I like to think about different aspects of them. For me, if you think about every single host has at least one parasite species, speciated to that, only for that, that means at least 50% of the Earth's biodiversity are parasitic species. And we know that some hosts that have more than one specific parasite, so thinking that planet Earth has at least 50% parasitic species is the most optimistic way to look at it. So, just because we don't see them, because they are small and microscopic, or because they are big and large, but hidden inside our bodies or body of our animals, doesn't mean that they are not important. That means after millions of years of evolution, the planet Earth, the way we see it, is the result of a rela relationship between parasitic species and host species. So, and that's very important. Actually, if you have time and you're interested, you can watch this YouTube video that the link is at the bottom. But there is more and more research showing that these dots are parasites, and these are actually parasitic species that hold all the host species on the planet connected to each other. Now imagine, we all say, and when I ask my students, and some of them are here, they are some of the smartest people doing vet science, animal science, and other courses, and they're all going to be future scientists, future decision makers, maybe future politicians, and the answer is parasite is bad, which means the first thing we're going to do is going to kill parasite. Now imagine you get rid of all this connection dot, all this host will fall over, and there won't be a planet as we can see it. And let me explain it a little bit more. I know many of you love fishing. And perhaps if you ever try to catch a trout, you tried cricket as a bait. Cricket is known to be one of the most 
favorite baits for the trout. But did you ever ask yourself, trout always lives in water, whereas cricket is a land animal. How does to even get connected that now you have to go and use it to feed them? The answer lies in a parasite, this worm, which many of you have seen them. If you ever had a bowl after a rainy day in your backyard with some water, you might have seen some big worm just swimming in them. If you haven't, doesn't matter. This worm exists and it lives in plenty of fresh water around this area and everywhere in the world. What does this worm do? Is this actually, as adults, is quite free living like anything else, and in the water, it produces eggs. The eggs just fall in the water and it hatch, and the larvae comes out. This larvae is a favorite food for a lot of insects' larvae. We know that insect lo insects lay their eggs in the water as well, and the eggs hatch and you have insect larvae in the water. So these insect larvae feed parasite larvae, but Instead of getting digested, the parasite actually goes to the flesh of this baby insect. And when the insect go through metamorphosis and become a beautiful uh, flying uh, insect, the parasite also comes out of the water with it and flies everywhere. Clearly, this insect is not a very healthy insect. It's a little bit sick, but we humans don't care because why should we care about this? We only care about animals that benefit us directly. Anyhow, then these insects get ingested by cricket, and poor cricket doesn't know what it goes for when it eats uncooked insect, exactly like us when we eat uncooked meat or vegetable or whatever. The risk is always higher to get sick if you don't cook things. So when the cricket get infected, that's quite interesting because parasite is now quite old. Like us humans, like any other organism, now it wants to mate, spread and have family. But it can't. How can it do it inside the cricket? So what it does is, like many other parasites, it increases suicidal thoughts and behavior in its host and make the cricket to actually commit suicide by drowning itself into the water. So what happens is, cricket just drown itself into the water, and there it comes, the trout, and eating it. And it happened over many years, and now we just not knowingly use cricket as a bait for trout. If you think about it, this worm alone, single-handedly, keeps all these different parts of the ecosystem together, between the water, between the land, and in between. And this is one of the most simple examples I'm giving you today. If you think about this beautiful planet with all different interactions between different elements of it, there are so many examples like this. So, that's really, really important for us. We had that relationship over millions of years and through the evolution until it came humans. And then with us, a lot of changes happen. And all those relationships, all those little circles started just to get changed. For example, we have farming. Don't get me wrong, nothing wrong with farming. I love food. I eat a lot of food. And farming is really good. But what may not be good is its attitude toward that. As a human, we are not ever happy. We produce food, and next year we want more. And then next year we even want more. Like Australia may be the top producer of some products, but then next year they definitely want to have more. If they don't, opposition politicians just say, oh, you've done bad, and stuff like that. And it's not only Australia, it's the rest of the world. And it's not only one type of farming, it's all sorts of farmings. And I just have three pictures here, but everything you can think of is like that. In this mayhem of competition, we start to forget what it costs for environment and for a lot of organisms that have no say in this planet. We're just covered by our thoughts and our competition here. 
And then, of course, we all love travel, and people who are my friends on Facebook know that I travel a lot too. But what we do with travel is we also get a lot of these things with us to different parts of the world. And now we are crazily traveling. We are not like Marco Polo anymore. And just we travel so much. Right now, who knows how many planes are in the sky taking people, animals, and everything from one place to another. So parasites, remember the definition of parasites. They are just free rider, hitchhikers, they just easily go everywhere. Not to mention multiculturalism and the lovely food they have, and a lot of food could also come as undercooked or uncooked with it. So all these things are examples of the way we impact and change all the balance between different things, knowingly or unknowingly. Urbanization is another one, and plus, undeniably global warming. And global warming particularly is important. I don't care who causes it. We are not after someone or you know, a criminal here. But if we go back to this very simple life cycle, you see all these animals are cold-blooded animals, which means the metabolism is affected directly by temperature around them. So as the temperature goes up, they are more active, they eat more, then they breed more, and then everything just becomes fast forward, quick and quick. And that means we have more populations of parasites and everything else coming with it. Now, it is quite interesting, if you ask many people, that where do you think in the world parasites are problematic? The answer is usually, oh, in developing countries, and I personally thought, that too, before I started my PhD, that parasites are a problem of developing countries or people who don't have good hygiene at all. But think about all these reasons that I showed you. It's actually now more problem of developed country than developing. Um, global change, multiculturalism, I mean, all developing countries all have political conflicts. Who goes there to for make those countries multicultural? It happens in developed countries that everyone wants to go there. That's one example, and a few other things. Now, let's look at how world approaching this. In many countries, for example, in the US, they recognize that these days, alarming, with alarming uh, frequency, uh, the population of parasites are increasing. And because of that, they started to work on developing resources to deal with this, and they started capacity building. Yet, there is report, for example, this one, published in one of the really good journals a few years ago, showing that if you catch a fish from an area in the water in the United States, that fish, compared to the exactly same fish collected from the same exact location 40 years ago, has 238 times more parasites. And this is only looking and limited to parasites that can infect humans by consuming fish, like if you consume sushi and things like that. If you put other parasites into this equation, it's just really scary. And similar research like that is happening everywhere in the world, Japan, European countries, even a lot of developing countries. Which means there is a lot of uh, at least strategies and planning to deal with it. Now, let's come back to Australia and see how we're dealing with parasites here in Australia. So, before the colonization, there are increasing evidence that the balance between different parts of the environment was pretty good. It may not have been perfect, but it definitely was a lot better than what it is today. And there is no evidence to suggest that we had main issues with parasites and stuff. But these days, this is our Australia. I don't think you can argue with that. The country we love is like this. Which means it also, and again, I'm not against any of this, these are all perfect, it makes our country great, but also we cannot ignore the impact of and transmission of parasites through these systems that we have. The outcome is my poor veterinary science students have to study 576 pages of this textbook during the parasitology subject, and believe it or not, 
all these parasites are imported after colonization. There is no native parasites that I teach them about. And it's just really scary what happened in Australia over the last over 200 years. So, in early days, Australia was perhaps in better situation despite all of this because soon after, there was good hospitals, good medical schools, and there were plenty of scientists in early days in Australia, even until mid-20th century. And they used to, you know, like inform government with their science and their findings about what's happening, what's not happening, and stuff. And a lot of good things started to happen. So, a lot of security borders and secure border securities that we have actually are results of all those efforts that have been done on early days in Australia. If you've ever been on Australian airport, you've seen things like that. And uh, you may even hear that people become millionaires in Australia just by working next to the airport with minimal resources just cleaning the shoes. Or you may have heard the story of this pigeon which named after Joe Biden, President of the United States, which was found on the rooftop in Victoria, and they wanted to kill him. And by the way, I think it turned out to be a female, but anyhow, they wanted to kill him or her because it could have brought diseases to Australia, and it was only due public outcry that its life got saved. So no wonder, when I came to Australia in 2002, and I got a scholarship from Melbourne Uni to do a PhD, I got a question and I was giving a seminar, PhD students have to do that at the beginning, and I got questioned by some very famous big name, uh, you know, that were in University of Melbourne, that why I'm even bothering to work on parasites in Australia, because Australia has very, you know, like excellent security border and everything. And he actually told me, that, you know, like, we don't need you here. And, of course, I thought, he's right, he's a professor, he, you know, like, he knows a lot of things. And then I thought, I better do some search and make sure that I'm doing things wrong. And I came across with everything that I told you now, good schools, good scientists, good rules. And I realized, even now, you know, at the beginning, we only had three medical schools at the time of Federation, but now we have one of the best, some of the best medical schools in the world. People come from everywhere to study in Australia. And I thought, oh my God, what I'm doing here? I have no future in Australia. And then I did a literature review. And this one only shows parasitic diseases in humans uh, after consuming uncooked fish. And I found that after 1960s, hasn't been any report in Australia at all. And I became more hopeless uh, about the future of my research and my future in Australia. Anyhow, so that's what happened. But I didn't take, take that long, and I realized that despite this rosy behavior, conception about the country, there are many parasites coming and going through Australia without us even realizing it. And there are reasons behind it. One of the reasons is many of those scientists after 1960 got retired and because everything was working well, Australia stopped to invest on those scientists and on those research and stuff like that. If you look at the investment, you can see the investment on diseases like malaria that have been eradicated in Australia and don't exist anymore is much higher than a lot of other diseases, that parasitic diseases that we have in Australia and farmers are dealing with them on a daily basis. Maybe because most of our politicians just live in cities and don't know what's happening in the outback. But anyhow, whatever reason is, the connection just got completely lost. So, now I introduce myself a little bit. As I said, I came to Australia in 2002 with my gorgeous daughter, who was a baby at the time. And after finishing my PhD, I started my postdoc in RMIT. And soon after, I moved to Vogue with my daughter years later. And I started my job at Charles Sturge University, which was, I really, really consider it lucky for so many reasons. It wasn't free of challenge, I have to say, but it was really good decision to come to Vogue for my career. 
And what I present today is the result of the teamwork created by many people. Some of them are here, some of them are in the room today, and many others that I didn't have room to include them here. And I really appreciate their commitment, their passion to the work and the results that has been found. This diversity of people also means that our group has different interests, and almost any animal you can think of, including those in Australia and overseas, has been picked up by people, and they just wanted to look for, you know, diseases and disease transmission. But our interest is not only to see, oh, they have parasites. I prove you there is a parasite, not at all. What we are keen and interested, all of us, is that to find those dots between, to see how this whole world get connected to each other, and what presence or absence of a parasite. Because if you don't have a parasite, that means something is also wrong. Those things just fall off. So why is that? This is the questions that we are interested and we want to do. And not only. And our group also collaborate with many countries. Here you're supposed to see all different continents and countries we have collaboration with. But I don't know why it looks like that. Doesn't matter. Trust me, we have a lot of collaborators overseas and also within Australia. So over the over all these years, what did we find? And I don't want to scare you with you know jargon, scientific jargons, and a lot of scary things. I just make it simple to you. What did we find? The first thing and the most important thing we found is the way we are looking for parasite is not right, and we are human. If we don't see it, it must not exist. So we developed some methods to detect parasites in animals. Because what happened was, because the population, you know, like we had good scientists and we had all these protocols, and then they gone, and little by little we became complacent. So what people usually do quite often, just get an animal, open it, look at different parts, and just say, okay, free of parasites. But it's not enough. If you just do post mortem, you don't find things. The other important thing we found is that parasites, quite often in Australia, could be in everything, and everything we do, we need to be conscious of parasites. This is a research has been done by Kira Brown, who did her honors last year and now got a scholarship to do PhD and work on this before. And what you're looking at here is. Deer. So we have few species of deer in Australia, and it's a very popular game animal. You know, like people go and shoot the deer and stuff. And then what they do is they eat those meat. So Kira came along and she said, "I'm interested to look at parasites and diseases in them." And we said, "Okay, let's look at parasites in the meat of these animals." And despite discovering few years ago that the way we look at it is for parasites is not perfect. The first thing we did was just looking at any visual sign in the body muscle of all these deer, and it's a very challenging research to do. She had to go with hunters, and they come with helicopters if you don't know, and you know, grab this big body of the deer from one place to another and stuff. But she did amazing job communicating with those people and getting samples and stuff. And we went through a lot of deer muscles body, and we didn't find anything. And she said, "I did my honors, and I didn't find anything after all this hard work." And I said, "Yeah, it's really upsetting. We, if we don't find parasites, we just have a really bad day that day." So, and I said, "How about randomly we pick few of them and just look at you know you employ molecular work and stuff to see what we can find." And plus, the method we used is the method that abattoirs use to detect parasites in the meat that we consume today. So, anyhow, then we thought, okay, let's go and do something else. We just completely randomly and blindly picked few of these deer, and we found that with PCR there are traces. Of parasite. Again, I don't want to go to details of PCR, but PCR told us it's a method we use looking at the DNA, and it told us parasites exist in this muscle, which means they are so tiny we couldn't see them. And we thought, if it's there, then find some more evidence if we can actually visualize them. So we pick some of these deer muscles that we already had, and. University has a veterinary diagnostic lab, which has really amazing stuff there and amazing staff as well. And they did 
cut this muscle very, very tiny, less than a millimeter section, and when you put it under the microscope with a very high magnification, we saw that, so here you're supposed to see the meat, and here in the middle you have these populations of tiny single-cell parasites. There is no way you can see it with naked eye, and they are there. And unfortunately, they all happen to be a parasite that is really bad. It can make, it can infect humans, and uh, it's, it's really bad. And it happened also to be introduced parasite to Australia. Which then raised the question, and that's why Kira also got encouraged to apply for PhD and continue her research, that how many of these parasites in abattoirs could also be in other animals and just pass the quality check? Anyhow, so that's one example of zoonotic parasites are commonly found in Australia. The other thing we found is we also sell parasite to customer under the quality food label. And this is a fish market in Australia. I don't name the fish market. But if you are like one of us and you walk everywhere, you can actually start to see parasites. And when you magnify it, you see the parasite is actually sitting there like a snake. It's just like that, and it just gets sold. You know, it's, I guess it's a really quality seafood because it has extra protein. The other thing we found was also that a lot of parasites in Australia are native. We have a lot of introduced ones, but we have native parasites. And the same way that we have really good-looking, cute animals like marsupials, koalas, and things like that, we also have really good-looking parasites that are only unique to Australia. They're still part of that original balance that was between different elements in the environment, that they need to be protected. But unfortunately, we have so many that came to Australia, like this one. This one called tongue worm, but it has nothing to do with tongue, and it's not even a worm. It's a Insect actually, closest relationship with uh, insects. And for years it's been in Australia, only recently we had again another couple of students who started to do research. And it's inside at the upper area of the nasal cavity of uh, carnivores, like foxes, like dogs, and a lot of other things. And because it was in that area, again, people just usually look at the body cavity, and it was never looked at. And we found that a large proportion of these animals in this area are infected with this parasite. And it's, again, quite nasty, because if you put it under the microscope, you see, actually, the body is covered with all these spikes, and that's actually how it moves inside the body and goes to different body parts. And unfortunately, it also infects livestock, but inside the lymph node of the livestock, which, again, usually doesn't get looked at in Australia. But as Australia becomes multicultural, we have some cultures that they love to eat different parts of the body. So these things are also infecting humans and needs to be added to the food safety guideline. Our team was also quite interested to know a lot of these introduced parasites, did they come sometimes in the past? And now we have that 576 textbook, and we don't have to add any more page to our Facebook te textbook, hopefully, or they are still coming true. So students definitely wanted no more pages, but unfortunately the answer is, and I'm working actually with the editors on the second revision of that book coming out soon, there's going to be much more, many more pages there, unfortunately, because parasites are still coming. For example, let's look at this map. This one published by Food and Agricultural Organization, just uh, 2020, I think. And it shows countries that we import uh, aquatic animals from, either as food or ornamental species or whatever. Anything related to aquatic comes from all this continent to Australia. And here it shows how much is produced in Australia and consumed domestically in the country. So think about Australia being a big island surrounded by water and everything. What percentage do you think we produce here when you go to a fish market? How much of the products do you think are Australian produced and how much are imported from other countries? 
Just think about it. I reveal the numbers. Only 12% of what you see in fish markets are Australian produced. 88% are coming from other countries. But what's the problem? The problem is there are issues with illegal fishing. There are issues with mislabeling in many countries. And again, unfortunately, our research showed that many parasites are even, you know, like our borders are here. But here in Riverina, in the heart of the country, we found plenty of these really, really invasive parasites in this area, killing our native animals. Not only fish, everything that eats fish. And they all came from this country, and we know that origin of these guys are from those countries, again, based on DNA tracing and a few other reasons. And unfortunately, it's still happening. Um, which raised, again, another question. You want to know if you get sick and you go to the doctor, I don't know how many of you love sushi, how many of you like kebabs like me, how many of you, you know, like all those exotic food. Uh, so if you do any of those and you get sick and you go to the doctor, usually you get diagnosed with food poisoning and stuff. That's the easiest answer, isn't it, a lot of time. So we just thought we, there was a real case of misdiagnosis among six people in Australia, which got published, by the way. I have a slide about it later. Based on that real case, we developed a survey and surveyed Australian medical doctors. An interesting case was that most medical, all of them, couldn't say a parasite caused those disease and those symptoms, which is quite a scary. Which means, like in the United States, which many years ago they realized that medical doctors in their country cannot deal with parasites and it's time to do something about it, Australia is now many years after that and they still haven't recognized that. So it's really important to be aware of that. Some scientists in Australia, and it's not only me saying this, there are a lot of other scientists in Australia saying this, and I, like this one is actually a pub publication by government itself. But for whatever reason, there is this lack of communication be between different parties in Australia, and it always amazes me because it's a free country, and everyone gets to speak up. It's not like some other parts of the world in the, you know, other countries. But, and because of that, it costs us, it costs our industry, it costs our businesses, it costs our environment. And really, it's not any surprise at all. Just a few months ago, we heard in, I, I heard myself in ABC News that Australia gives up the fight against bee mites, which is really bad. Or we have all these oyster farmers really struggling for many years, and the disease is just going all around there. This is our research, which is quite scary. These parasites actually make a hole in your gut and cause a lot of diseases. And we found native birds dying because of this. We found native fish dying because of this, and a lot of other things happening here. And also, not surprising that you all heard the story of that poor woman who got the worm in, his brain, in her brain, and it took doctors six months and eventually a brain surgery to get surprised and say, for the first time, we found the parasites in the human brain. It's not the first time, maybe for you, but anyhow, it happens always. And that's, again, and we get publications by Australian doctors that it may put Australia's reputation as the forefront of education in question, which then get picked up. Uh, there was that publication about misdiagnosis, and then it get picked up by other scientists from other countries that we make mistake here in Australia about diagnosis of parasitic diseases. So before it gets too late, we really, really have to do something about this. And as scary is, it's now 20-something years I'm in Australia. I'm a parasitologist, so it's how I uh, earn money and how I live. And I still go sometimes to the doctor, 
And doctor says, oh, what are you doing for a living? And I know where it's going. So I always say, I work at university. And sometimes they really want to know because I guess I'm immigrant or something. And then eventually they put me on a corner and I say, I work on parasites. And then they say, but do we even have parasites in Australia? We don't. And that's, anyhow, this complacency is quite interesting. So I leave you at that. And all I want you to think about is that everything we do, in one way or another, has impact on our environment. And it's not good for anyone just to be focused on human and human benefit. That's the most important message we can get from research in parasitology. The key message is Australia lacks expertise. And when we don't have expertise, we don't produce evidence. And when we don't have evidence, then of course nothing will happen. And everything comes from that. And uh, anyhow, uh, it's very promising for me that I see some of the future generation of parasitologists sitting here. And uh, I'll leave you at that. And thank you so much for coming over and spending your time here, either in person or online. <laughs>